Hey, how you doing? This is RJ. Welcome back to my weekday videos where I do interesting interviews and conversations with prominent people about storytelling and culture. But before we get into the interview, I just want to remind everyone that my Indiegogo campaign for my new graphic novel, The Valiant Heroes, is still open. You're looking at some of the spectacular art in the background. It is an 82-page spectacular of good old superhero epic storytelling and fun. The campaign has been shadow banned, so the only way that you can get to it is by having the direct link, and the link for that is in the description if you want to go over and take a look at my graphic novel. Also in the description is the link for my new graphic novel, the campaign for which will be starting in about five months. The link is for the early bird signup page. If you sign up there for my new book, which is Crom the Destroyer, which is a fantasy book in the vein of Conan and the Celtic myth that inspired it. But if you go over to that early bird page and leave your email, you will receive an email when the project goes live. And if you then order anything from that campaign, you will receive a free pinup poster with your order. So if any of that sounds or looks appealing to you at all, you might want to check out those links in the description and go on over and see if my graphic novels are for you. All right, so today I have with me Wes from Thinking Critical. And Wes, a lot of people have requested that I bring you on to my show to to these interviews because I've been on your channel a couple of times that we talked about the state of comics. And um, you're actually one of the bigger names that people have asked for to talk about comics here on the Fourth Age. So welcome finally to the Fourth Age channel. Well, thanks for having me. I've always appreciated coming over onto my channel, talking about comic books and Lord of the Rings and all the kind of geek culture stuff. It's it's what I live for, so I'm happy to be here. So the, one of the reasons why I really wanted to talk to you about, uh, well, comics in particular, is because I would say that you are the most objective uh, media analyst. I would call it, that's what I would call you for comics right now, because for myself and a lot of other people, um, we have a dog in the fight. Um, I'm trying to sell comics, right? And a lot of the creators that I'm talking to, I've talked to Chuck Dixon. I've talked to, um, well, Graham Nolan. I just finished talking to Mike Barron and, uh, you know, we're all trying to sell comics. So sometimes we might not uh, be able to see the blind spots in, in what we're looking at with comics. But for you, uh, I find that you're very objective and that um, that's needed right now because I talk about storytelling on these interviews. Well, I do and appreciate the kind I don't words know before you... I did this. You know, I was in the military for about 20 years and 15 of that, I was actually an intelligence analyst. So just looking at information, and being able to kind of parse out what's actually going on is kind of my specialty. And it's kind of really helped me out uh, just looking at the comic industry and some of the trends and kind of what they all mean and parsing it out. And I think we need that more than ever right now, because um, I don't know if you covered it on your channel. I did a video about the Writer Guild, Writers Guild of America. They did a, a two hour a Zoom call about the the actual title was um queering legacy characters i think it was mostly for dc but they had some marvel writers in there as well and i think what they showed with that video was that they're using comics as an incubator for these ideas that they want to bring into television shows because they had show writers and they had comic book writers and they had a producer for for wb shows i think it was and that's what comics are to, to these people right now, an incubator for these ideas that they want to bring into television and movies and into popular culture. So I think looking at comics and especially looking at it in the way that you do uh, objectively is is very much needed. That was, a, that was an interesting Zoom call. I'm surprised that one ended up getting out. You know, obviously the big name in there, at least from comic books, was James Tynan. And when you think about it, a lot of what James Tynan does now is, or create her own things and there's almost always a James Tynan self-insert character in his story. If you read, uh, was it Something is Killing the Children, the little boy that's being saved, that is James Tynan. Just so happens he's gay, right? Just like James Tynan's gay. So there's always this weird, not weird, but there's always a stand-in character for James Tynan that's always gay. Before that, he was working mostly on DC stuff with, with their characters. And certainly the, the character that comes to mind um, you know, is the first Green Lantern where he went back and said, uh, you know, basically retcon the sexuality of, of uh, my goodness, uh, Alan, Alan, Alan Scott. Scott. Yeah, he went back and retcon the sexuality of Alan Scott, and now Alan Scott, you know, just in continuity, is, uh, is a gay character now. Even though he was straight for, I don't know, 75 years, 
But we're seeing this kind of thing more and more. And when you see a writer like James Tynan, who's been very successful, he wrote Batman. He wrote some of the more successful, uh, highest selling Batman probably of the last two or three years. You know, people are going to follow those trends because they see him as a leader when really he's just using comic books like as a Trojan horse to get his ideas and his ideology kind of into the mainstream. At least that's what he's trying to do. So I had a very interesting um, comment on one of my videos just about a week ago, and I was talking about how, for me anyways, the way that I look at it and I analyze it, I would say that really this stuff started to enter into comics, I would say, and the, really the downfall of the the um, the merit-based system started, for me anyways, again, would be around 1996. And someone said in the, in the comments, I'm 20 years old. Are you telling me that Marvel and DC Comics haven't been any good for my entire life? And I kind of just said, yeah, <laughs> I would do. I want to know you. your take on that. <laughs> that's what I wanted. To, that's exactly what I want you been... to do. Tell me what you think the origin is. Well, as far as you've never had a good Marvel or DC in your lifetime, if you're 20 years old, I would say that is resoundingly not true. In fact, two of the better periods for both Marvel and DC have happened within the last 15 years, starting about 2010, I believe, maybe a little bit earlier than that when Joe Casada first takes over Marvel comics. And he does bring in Brian Michael Bendis, which ended up not working out in the end, but was certainly very good at the beginning. He ended up bringing in Rick Remender. He ended up bringing in a Jonathan Hickman. A lot of really good writers like that. Yeah, you did get your Matt Fractions or whatever, but Marvel Comics was really awesome for about five years. The first five years of Joe Quesada's reign as the EIC of Marvel Comics is really, really good. And then about six years ago, following the New 52 DC Comics, Specifically, Jeff Johns realized the folly of changing all the characters and doing everything they could to destroy the universe and decided to bring the best versions of all the DC characters they could in DC Rebirth. And for about 18 months, depending on the series, it might go out to 24 months. DC Comics is about as good as you're going to get, especially if you're like a Superman fan. You're never going to get better Superman than, than the Peter J. Tomasi Superman, the Dan Jurgens action comics, and the Peter J. Tomasi and Patrick Gleason Super Sons. Uh, you know, we're not getting anything nearly that good for Superman right now. So there have been two two periods where DC and Marvel were really, really good. But for the most part, it has been on a downtrend. And I would say when it really starts going off the rails is when Brian Michael Bendis becomes the guy at Marvel Comics. He is part of the Portland Mafia, and he starts incorporating or uh, bringing in all of his friends that are far less talented than him and were and weren't weren't nearly as good as hiding like uh, their true motivations as far as what they wanted their characters and then you get the stuff with like the Matt fractions and all that stuff where they really go hard after the marvel characters themselves and start destroying the legacy heroes you know the big the, the big 3 in, in the avengers thor iron man uh, Captain America pretty much all replaced. Captain Marvel comes in and now she's the savior. And now they start, uh, you know, retconning sexualities. Now there's a new version of every character that's younger and more diverse. And then that's really the real downfall of Marvel and DC. Well, Marvel at that point, DC is following Rebirth, in my opinion. Well, I'll have to concede that point with you because I was just talking with Professor Geek about this exact thing. I would say that after Marvel, no, sorry, after DC, really does something to mess up its continuity it tries to rally around its central characters and you do get really good stories when they try to rally around those characters and and resell them to to their audience so yes i will concede that point you are correct you got some good comics there it was very unfortunate that that jeff johns was tabbed by warner brothers to be like one of the main producers for their dc films and he couldn't continue on as the chief creative officer of DC Comics. And the power went back to Dan Didio, who had already gone out of his way to destroy the characters in New 52. You know, and then we get Dark Knight's Metal, we get Heroes of Crisis, we get Bettis on Superman, and basically everything falls apart in about nine months. Okay, so I want to do big picture just for one second. And I know it's an obvious probably answer to everyone, but what would you say is the biggest problem with comics right now? just in general for the for the entire industry. We're talking about America, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting. We, we kind of had this conversation just a little bit on a live stream this weekend. 
there was certainly an issue 10 years ago, or maybe 10 to 15 years ago, there was an accessibility issue with comic books. Even if the comics were good, most people didn't know they were there and they couldn't access them. Smartly, <laughs> Joe Quesada and Marvel Comics identify that there is an accessibility issue with comic books, but they thought the accessibility issue was actually the characters and the stories in the universe. And they said, this isn't accessible to a new audience. So they went and actually destroyed like, all the stuff that worked within Marvel Comics and replaced their accessibility issue, i.e. people couldn't get to them and didn't know they were there with an enormous quality issue, which is much more prevalent right now than even the accessibility issue, which is obviously uh, hasn't really been addressed. And with the issues of comiXology, uh, you know, it's even worse right now because the platforms that DC and Marvel have for digital aren't very good. But if you look at manga and what they're doing in Japan and Korea specifically, you know, a majority of their comic book sales are digital because they realize, you know, we'll use the Shonen Jump app as a, an example, that they could, they could make everything very accessible via a tablet or a phone. Everyone's got a smartphone right now. And it's only $3 a month. And you could access the day that it's released to every single manga that they produce. Like, you don't just get certain select titles when you pay that price. You get everything, and that digital app has become the new spinner rack because we don't have that anymore because the newsstand is dead. You can't get comic books in your uh, your pharmacy or whatever, or the grocery store aisle, and they have used that as their new spinner rack. DC and Marvel didn't do that. They thought their accessibility issue were, was the characters were too old-fashioned. They were too white. They were too straight, and they went and they kind of destroyed all that. So now, really, the big problem is quality. There is enormous dearth when it comes to good quality comic books. Uh, you know, it's it's on one hand, it's Batman, Superman, World's Finest, it's The Flash. You know, it maybe Batman by Chip Zdarsky, maybe, but you know, even that fell off kind of kind of quickly. The only good things really Marvel are producing right now are all their throwback series that are with really good quality writers from the, like the '90s and 2000s writing stories in continuity from 30 years ago that don't have anything to do with their main line right now. So it's really a quality issue, but really the big problem that's really going to be their downfall is the accessibility issue because people just don't know they're there. And even if they do, they probably don't even have a comic shop anymore. So you touched on a couple of things I wanted to talk about. And the first one I wanted to bring up was the fact that you do cover older comics on your channel every once in a while, which is great. And you get to see great creators and great art. So uh, before we get into the story, I want to talk about um, the art for a minute, because you follow Marvel and DC a lot closer than I do. And is there, a, I, honestly, I, I don't, right now, if I pick up a book, even if it has fantastic art, and I look at the cover and find out who is writing it, and I know it's someone I'm not going to enjoy, I still put it down. So I don't really know the artists as well as I used to, not in any way. But can you tell me if there are any really good artists working for Marvel and DC right now that have a future in comics? Something, someone who we're going to remember their name in 10 years from now? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, you know, the big name that pops out in my head is Jorge Menez, who was illustrating uh, Batman, obviously, uh, before Chip Zdarsky came over. I think he did the first story arc with Chip as well. Right now he's doing the uh, the Nemesis Reloaded series with Mark Miller. Shockingly, Mark Miller pays a better page rate than DC and Marvel, so he got a little break there. But Jorge Menez is really, really good. He's the one that really pops out in my mind. I think, I think Pepe Larraz is a Marvel artist, not quite as good as Jorge, but he's a really good artist. But here's, here's the problem. <laughs> you brought up another issue, especially with Marvel comics. When they get an artist like Pepe Larraz, kind of because what happened in the 90s with the Image 7 or whatever, they don't ever want them to become superstars. So Pepe Larraz might work on House of X, you know, Powers of 10 for five issues or whatever. And then after that, he's, a, you know, kind of an established name. People like his art. And then he just leads off series. He'll illustrate the first three issues of a run. And then he moves to the next next series and he illustrates three issues of that. And he never really establishes himself as like one of the great X-Men artists or one of the great Hulk artists or anything like that. Because they just have him moving them around trying to get a sales bump on all the number one issues. So that's kind of one of the really weird things that Marvel Comics does. DC doesn't do that nearly as much. Now, there's a couple of other 
artists over at DC. I really like Ricardo Federici. I don't know that he's going to be like a, a big mainstream guy because he's more of like a, a horror type fantasy artist, but he's a, he's really good. Um, the, the name's escaping right now, but the guy that did dark crisis on infinite earths, like his art is really, really good. And he's, he's a newer guy. The other Reed, Marvel I, name, I don't know his name off the top of my head, but I do have those books. They look good. And the other name is Marco Cicchetto from Marvel. He actually has had a long run on Daredevil where he'll do one arc, he takes an arc off, and then he comes back and does another arc. He's been on the character for about three or four years. But he, he's a really good artist. He, he's from Italy, I believe. Well, yeah, again, there's a couple of things I wanted to touch on there. I find, and I'll just run this by you, because I don't know if this is true or not. It's just something that's always scratched in the back of my head, especially for Marvel. I see that uh, when they do their, I think it's Stormbreakers, where they introduce mm -hmm. all the people that are new for Marvel. I say to myself, how come, I, I know it's a global market now, but you look at it and you get maybe one person out of 10 who's from North America. And I'm thinking to myself, are they specifically looking to go to other countries in order to get cheaper artists? Is that what they're doing? Do you find yes. that that might be what they're doing? That's why you get so many South American artists, because, you know, as someone who lives in the Philippines, the cost of living here just isn't nearly as high as it is. Uh, either in, in America or in Europe or whatever. So you tend to get a lot of newer artists breaking in from places where you don't need quite as much money and are willing to work for the page rates that Marvel and DC Comics are offering right now, which quite frankly haven't increased in 30 years and in a lot of cases have actually decreased. So, you know, you're in the same boat I am. You know, I'm almost 45 years old. I got a family. I got three kids. You know, I, you, if you didn't give me a page rate increase in 15 years, I couldn't work for you anymore. Are you kidding? My life is changing as all these things are happening. So, um, you know, very few artists really get a breakout like a Greg Capullo or whatever. So they're absolutely scouring the market, you know, over here in East Asia, South America, looking for artists that live in places that are lower income, that, that can afford, the, afford to live on the page rate. That is absolutely happening. I find, honestly, that um, it seems to me anyways, that, again, you get all of these foreign artists and it's not so much, I mean, some of them are great, but um, I don't know. They don't go through the, the comic system when I listen to or read these interviews, these older interviews with, you know, Gil Kane or even um, Jack Kirby. They talk about working in a system that uh, deals with, you know, advertising and they'll flip back and forth from comics to advertising, sometimes in uh, animation, things like that. And... Uh, even Jack Kirby started, if I remember correctly, doing books which no longer exist. Things like, you know, the old Donald Duck or Richie Rich kind of books where you started with a very basic, you know, you didn't know, need to know anatomy, anything like that. And then you moved up to romance, which he did. And I think a number of artists did like uh, John Buscema. And then you got into the superhero comics that no longer exists anymore. Or if it does, it's an anime and manga. And that's where you're going to find someone who can climb the ladder in that way but i find that uh, if you get somebody from from north america they have no no knowledge of of these basic fundamentals of art in order to to be a new gil kane or, or a new john buscema or anything like that so i was talking to aaron lepresti maybe a year and a half ago and he kind of touches on that and he would disagree with you to a degree he says there's better illustrations now in comic books than there's ever been but the visual storytelling itself is almost completely absent. So the way it was explained to me, and it kind of makes sense, is back in the, you know, even the 80s, if you would open up magazines, there would be all these illustrations, all these, uh, you know, advertisements and stuff. There were all these opportunities for illustrators to make money commercially doing their trade, you know, and they can do the stuff that they really want to do on the side while they're, you know, making advertisements and stuff like that. Certainly, uh, all the big comic book artists back in the day would have been doing advertising on the side as a way to, way to make more money. But there really aren't magazines anymore, and the advertisements that you do see, they're not really drawn. It's all computer-animated stuff right now. So those artists that are available, there's far fewer opportunities for them to actually make money so comic books is one of the few places where you can actually, you know, go out there and draw the work yourself and still get paid to do it. But they're not necessarily comic book fans or 
they're not really visual storytellers like a Jack Kirby uh, or a lot of those greats coming up. So you have great illustrators, but you they have no sense of actually how to tell a story visually. They don't realize that comic books are a visual medium. Everything needs to be in motion. Each panel is an action within the story itself. And that's why you get so many redundant panels that are going on in comic books. You get really uh, boring layouts when it comes to the stories themselves. They, they make no sense, you, you know, because um, I think the visual storytelling itself, that craft is almost uh, died out or it's going as extinct within comic books. That's why I like a Jorge Jimenez, who you can tell absolutely grew up on comic books and manga. His visual storytelling is dynamic. It's awesome. It feels like comic books. But then you go over to Marvel and maybe like a Russell Dowderman, who I think has done a lot more work within Hollywood where he would do costume designs and stuff like that. And yes, the costumes in his comic books, his Thor comics especially, look cool. But if you look at the layouts and you look at the actions, it's really, really mundane because he's not a visual storyteller. He's just an illustrator. That's something that um, Graham Nolan had talked about when I had him on here for an interview. He said there's a big difference between an illustrator and a sequential artist. And he said, you know, that's what you see right now. You see illustrators, and especially that's why you see what he calls evergreen covers, which you could slap on any book. They're not, mm -hmm. you know, have anything to do with the story inside. And so that's what you get. But I wanted to actually talk about that for a minute because you're talking about great art and there are great artists out there, but, and you know, old stories and old great comics. I'm looking at old great comics and I'm, I'm looking at something like, um, honestly, I would think, uh, I did a video about this at one time. The greatest X-Men book would be, uh, the Paul Smith one where he had, um, Wolverine fighting with silver samurai. And that fight scene for me is, is the penultimate fight scene for, for a comic. But if you look at it and, and almost all is art, in general, there's not a lot of backgrounds there. I think that the iconic part of of comics that has gone from the 80s is that you had these standout uh, again because they're <clears throat> excuse me again because there were good visual storytellers. There were so good visual storytellers they didn't need to put any backgrounds in at all, and so they concentrated on the characters, and so they drove it forward that way but now you get these artists who are putting in so much detail and i understand that they want detail in the background but i don't think it's necessary i don't think it's actually wanted if you're looking for an iconic action scene i think it muddies the visuals for me anyways um but again i think that perhaps the simplicity and going back to that simplicity of drawing um even with with limited to no backgrounds would do uh, comics so much good right now because you could get the art done so much quicker um, and you could you could get great artists putting up more books. What's your take on that? We've definitely seen a change in art. That started like in the 90s, but I, I know what you're talking about. Where the background itself is a distraction to the action taking place in the panel. Now, if you have Batman driving through Gotham, yes, you want to see the detail of the city and, and where he is as that setup shot. But when Batman's, you know, kicking Bane's butt, you don't really need to see everything in the background. I want to see everything, you know, spotlighting Batman and Bane fighting in those action scenes. And that's visual storytelling. But like when you had like a Todd McFarlane come in and blow everybody's minds, you know, first he came out with, with, with Hulk. He was doing that run, obviously, with uh, Peter Dave. And then he started doing Spider-Man. He would put so much detail and then we had a lot of other artists kind of come around at the same time, Mark Silvestri and stuff like that. And it almost became the norm. If you were a good comic book artist, you also had like an enormous amount of detail involved in the stories as, as well. Although McFarlane did know when to use a negative space or, or when to preclude using backgrounds and stuff. But I, I think because those guys, specifically the, like the Image 7, were so influential to artists coming up that have been breaking into the industry for the last 20 30 years that it's almost like if you don't have detail it, it means you're not a good artist but um i it, it's, it gets really distracting it definitely does so i had heard uh, i don't know who i was listening to i was listening to someone who has connections with the uh, comic industry and they were talking about well again i talked to rini who does a uh, fiendish um, she has a crowdfunded mm -hmm. comic and she was uh, talking about the difference between manga and um and uh, North American comics and how uh, DC basically just looked at her stuff and said, no, it's too manga. 
And Marvel said, yeah, maybe. And they, they brought her on and uh, wanted her to change her style a little bit. But I find it funny um, that, again, what I was listening to was the fact that uh, you get some of these higher ups saying to themselves now, hey, wait a second, I'm looking at manga artists and it's really cheap compared to what you're going to pay for North American art. And I, I'm thinking to myself, well, of course it's really cheap because they draw in a completely different way wherein there's, you know, well, there's some of them that do extremely detailed backgrounds, but a lot of them do, you know, just movement lines and it's, it's very quick. And um, I honestly think that that might be the direction that comics will have to go into because, you know, their, their profit margin is dipping so low that they're going to have to cut the corners somewhere. And, and I know they've been cutting corners on art a lot lately, but if they start looking at more, long. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I hope not. Um, but again, um, would you think that um, manga is actually going to, as an art style anyways, not not as a storytelling vehicle, but more as an art style, um, be introduced into, into comics in order to try to save it? Well, it's certainly very influential right now. When people describe Jorge Jimenez's art, which I say is probably the best modern art that you're going to see, it's described as American manga for a reason. It's very manga influenced. Sean Gordon Murphy is an absolutely dynamite artist for DC Comics doing those Batman White Knight series. He is absolutely inspired by manga, you know, manga art. That's where a lot of his inspiration is is from. And you're seeing, because Marvel and DC basically have lost a generation or two of comic readers to manga, you're going to see most of the artists come in that are interested in doing maybe this type of art are going to be heavily manga influenced. So that's definitely going to happen. But manga is really different in the layouts and the format of the actual reading. So in a comic book page, a North American comic book page, you might get five to, to seven, maybe even nine panels sometimes with all the actions that are taking place within the story. Whereas in manga, typically each one of those panels will be a page or perhaps two of those panels will go onto one page. So um, the amount of, of detail in storytelling that goes on per page compared to North America versus manga is, is one of the formatting differences between the two. And obviously um, North American comic comics are typically colored, although we are seeing a, a heavy increase in colored manga as well as covered colored manhwa. Uh, we're even seeing like, um, I think is it, uh, I, can't, I can't remember the, the big series had a thousand volumes. Uh, that, that one's getting, getting released in color. So the other thing that I was thinking about was the fact that, um, you see, you can have these artists where uh, the thing is that you can have, they, they hired, I guess, storytellers where you can cut corners. They cut corners all the time. You can tell that they're not editing correctly and they're just slapping this down on the page, but you can do that as a, as a writer. You want to be a bad writer. You can do that. But an artist can't do that. An artist is, if, even if you are a bad artist, it's probably going to take you longer to finish the page than you are a good artist. And and if you're a good artist, again, it's it's the amount of time that goes into it. So I was wondering, uh, well, I think I was listening to you actually um, talking about um, Static Shock and how um, the, the, the artist for that is taking over some of the storytelling detail um, on that book as well. So he's going to be doing um, the plotting as well as uh, as the art. Again, that sounds to me like um, an old school Jack Kirby thing. It sounds to me like um, what uh, Rob Liefeld wanted to do to begin with. Uh, do you think we're going to see more of that, more of the artist taking over the storytelling uh, element in order, again, to save money because they just can't pay two people at the same time? Perhaps, but it, it's funny. Nicholas Draper Ivy, the illustrator for Static Shock, about two years ago, actually went on to, to uh, Twitter. He was really frustrated and was like, I am so tired of illustrating people talking and eating. And uh, the writer for Static Shock was Vita Ayala, and she ended up apologizing to him publicly. So I'm not surprised. It feels like Vita Ayala is kind of getting phased out of comic books right now. But they are cutting a lot of corners. The death of the inker has really, really, really hurt American comic books. A lot of times the pencilers are inking their own work now, and I think that's been to the detriment to a lot of these comic books. You know, because they're just not paying enough. So you, you double dip and you pay the guy to ink his own work as well. You get a little bit of a discount. But you don't get that professional inker to go over with it and have a different perspective 
and maybe accentuate all the things that are happening or see something that's a problem area and just remove it and stuff like that. So the, the death of the inker has been really bad. I think digital coloring is destroying comic books. They are not fun to look at anymore. If you look at all the, the mixing of colors and stuff, everything looks like diarrhea now. It's just different shades of <laughs> green and brown and orange all in the background. Back in the day, they had a limited color palette that they could work with when they were coloring because they were all doing it by like marker and stuff. And the comic books popped, the costumes popped, the backgrounds popped, everything looked cool. It was vibrant, it was exciting. If you look at comic books nowadays, now that everything is being digitally colored and everyone's just using Procreate or whatever, they look like ass, in my opinion. I could not agree more on both of those points. I am right on board with the fact that digital digital coloring does not work for me at all. And at, at the same time, um, with the inking, again, uh, you don't realize exactly how much money they're saving by getting the pencilers to do their own inking. Um, I started to switch because I have Renzo. Renzo wants to do his own inking. At the same time, um, he... Uh, when he was working on my books, um, we had to get um, Mike Gustavich, who is an old DC and Marvel anchor uh, and artist at the same time. Uh, he had to do some of the inking at the end because it, it just took too long. You, you mm -hmm. take almost twice as much, but you're not paying twice as much. And that's the thing. And uh, for, for my other books, I, I moved over to, um, I have Jim O'Reilly doing uh, the Conan-like book that I'm doing. And Jim just put so much detail into every page. And I know if he inked it himself, he would take forever. It would look spectacular but it would take forever so i'm getting mike to do the the inking on that as well and i think bob lewis um, um is working on another one of my books and it's not cheap it is not cheap at all but the thing is that it makes <laughs> it makes going through the art so much faster and at the same time you get a, a double look at every page from two artists which makes it much better uh, i gotta say so i agree with you completely on all, all those points yeah, the line weight can make a really big impact on your ability to ascertain what's actually happening. And for that moment, the thing that you really want to pop to really jump out at you, you know, if you don't have that professional inker getting that line weight correct and really make make things uh, pop out, the things that are supposed to be closer to you, you know, appear that way, you know, it really just throws off the image. It makes it feel very 2D, um, which isn't a bad thing, you know, it is comic books, but... When you throw that little extra effort in there, it just makes everything look better. It's crisper. It's more exciting. So one of the, the funny things that I wanted to bring up with you is I wanted to know if you noticed this. But the funny thing, again, is that we're talking about all of this and how they're trying to save money and, and how they're cutting corners. And um, the little guy is really getting it in the end. Um, the artists and the storytellers, to some extent, they're not being paid. There's so many stories about people being paid half, things like that. And I find it so funny that you have these people who are always going on about social justice and they're just sticking it to the little guy <laughs> when they're trying to make money off of art. I've read so many, again, read so many interviews with people like Gil Kane for, for some part of um, his career. He said, no, I stopped working for comics. Why? Because they started to shove this, this uh, contract in front of us where we, we didn't have what we used to have, where we didn't have as much control over the things we create. And he said, I'm gone. I'm going, going back to advertising and for comics you had, I know there's a left wing streak in comics, but that left wing streak did to some extent bring out um, real fact that, you know, we got to make sure that everybody gets paid correctly and everybody, you know, keeps on having a living wage. I don't see that happening anymore. And especially from companies who shout to the rooftops that they're doing justice all over the place and, and want to scream social justice. Yeah, well, I mean, they're, they've driven off so many so many readers at this point. It's almost hard to make a living wage anymore, anyway. Unless you're, you know, you're like a Scott Snyder, and even he stopped working for DC Comics, right? He's doing his own thing on Comicsology. He's got some Dark Horse stuff coming out, and it feels like all the the big name writers kind of abandoned ship over the last two or three years. And I don't think it's a coincidence, you know, that James tied it with the Substack that that uh, Scott Snyder with the Substack and in, in Comicsology. And Jonathan Hickman went to Substack and like all these people are kind of doing their own thing. And Greg Capullo, he's not working for DC Comics anymore. He's just going out and doing a bunch of indie stuff. I know a lot of uh, artists have gone over and worked for Mark Miller and his Netflix uh, Miller World comics that he's doing. You know, Mark Miller is a great storyteller. He knows how to write comic books. And guess what? He actually pays his artists. 
that's one of the things that, that makes me laugh so hard is you have all these these people out there that are really responsible uh, for for destroying the American comic book industry as we know it. And they would like to talk down to, uh, you know, Zach from Comics Matter or whatever. And he pays all of his artists on time every single time. And I've talked to some people and he's worked out deals where he's paid them ahead of time. You know, it, it, these guys aren't getting paid for the work they're doing, but they're going to sit there and talk crap about him because he was willing to out them and the corrupt industry that they're a part of. You know, it, it's pretty ridiculous, but it kind of shows you uh, just how corrupt the industry really is. Yeah. And again, I was talking to um, Graham Nolan just last week and he was saying, you know, we used to go to as artists, go back to Marvel and DC because A, they were the only game in town if you wanted to be a serious comic book artist and B, they paid well. And he said, you could walk in with mm -hmm. 30 pages and, and walk out with a check. And he said, even if they still had that today, which he said they don't, even if they still had that, they don't allow the creator owned um the, they don't allow people to bring their A game because, again, what you're creating, that's going to be belongs 100% to Disney, 100% to Marvel. You're no longer going to get any share in, in uh, what you're creating like those old creators used to do. So there's no reason to bring your A game and create new characters and make things spectacular because um, just bringing, bringing your C game is, is enough to get you what they pay you. Yeah, yeah, you're just working for the contract. It's kind of one of those weird things. You know, DC, obviously, back in the day, they had Vertigo, where you could come up with original ideas that maybe weren't superheroes, or maybe they were superhero related, but, or related, but they weren't like DC Comics, you know, superheroes and stuff like that. And as soon as Neil Gaiman's Sandman took off, and he started making money on Sandman that DC Comics weren't getting their hands on, they like changed all the contracts. So even the stuff at Vertigo, which were the creator's own ideas, those weren't DC ideas. Those weren't DC editorial ideas. They started saying we want to, we want the, you know, the the a significant piece of the pie of that as well. And that's why basically all those ideas ended up going to Image Comics. They basically shot themselves in the foot, and they let everyone know here is not the place to be creative. Yeah, I agree, and. Well, I wanted to talk to you for just one one second about um, something else that you've been covering for a while. And it's the fact that, um, well, you have comic journalists who call themselves journalists. And I think that's part of the problem um, with holding the companies to account right now is that they're not really journalists at all. Uh, again, going back to, I always, because for the last six to eight months, I've been reading voraciously all these um, interviews with older, um, older comic pros. And you have the comic journalists actually challenging them. I had never seen that today. I, I read, um, um, I guess it was an interview with, who was it? I think Neil Adams, where the interviewer looked at him and said, you have a reputation for being slow. Can you talk about that? And Neil Adams did not like that question at all. <laughs> but at the same time, and I think it cut, I think it cut that interview a little bit short because he said, can you rephrase that? How's about you rephrase that? I don't think of myself as slow. But at the same time, it was an honest interview and it was an honest calling him on uh, some of his ways of dealing with with being creative. We don't see that at all anymore. I, I, the closest thing I would say that could, to come to any of that would be your channel. But within the mainstream uh, journalism for comics, you don't see anything like that at all. Yeah, they're pretty much all bought and paid for with free comics, which just kind of tells you how depressing it is. But, you know, it's the wizard factor. You know, you used to have Wizard Comics magazine out there. And they were, you know, the, the tastemakers for comic books. If you could get your art on the cover there or an interview and impress people, or if you could get on their top 10 best writers or artists list, it meant that you were somebody and people were going to take notice of you. Unfortunately, you know, which, which happens when you start getting into business with each other, people started realizing at Wizard Comics that this could be my gateway to work for Marvel or DC as an editor or a writer or maybe to go in and work on their marketing departments and stuff like that. And they just kind of got in bed with each other. And then all of a sudden, Wizard Comics just doesn't have that credibility anymore. People can see right through inauthenticity, which is what people see when they go to CBR or Comics Beat or Newsarama or Bleeding Cool or whatever. They know there's not a single real thought being presented to the readers. It's what DC and Marvel 
or the comic book writer themselves, you know, if they're indie or whatever, it's what they want them to convey to their readers rather than the honest truth. And that's why they're insignificant. That's why nobody goes to those sites for real honest information. Sure, you can go there for like the news release because they're going to get those and stuff, but they're not going to have good, honest editorial insights onto the comic book industry. They're not going to ask Marvel and DC, why are you burning the, the industry down? Why are you driving so many people away? Was this a good idea? You know, you canceled John Kent, you canceled the John Kent Superman book after only 18 issues. What went wrong? They would never dare ask them questions like that because if they actually held their feet to the fire and did their job, there's not a, a job waiting for them on the other side that they're hoping to get. So I wanted to ask you one more question because you have a lot more connections than I do. And I don't get to listen to every one of your videos. I wish I had the time, but I, I spend too much time in the computer to begin with. <laughs> so, uh, but I've heard rumors again, um, and, and then just rumors, but uh, the, the idea that Disney is hurting so much right now that there, there might be a reckoning where in they look at something like Star Wars and say, we might have to sell this. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, if is there any chance that, that would ever happen to Marvel? Do you think? I know it's it's such a big money maker for them right now, and it it's something that's uh, outstripping Star Wars because they haven't destroyed it with uh, their third or their fourth or fifth phase yet. But looking into a crystal ball into the future with your analyzation, analy analytical. Sorry, I got a tongue twister there. Analytical <laughs> uh, capabilities. Uh, would you think that? Um, Marvel and DC are ever going to go back into a more uh, smaller company out of the hands of these large conglomerates? Going back to becoming comic book companies, absolutely not. There's no way Disney can get rid of the Marvel IP at this point. It's their biggest moneymaker when it comes to movies. It, it theoretically brings in the most attention to their streaming channel. Just the, you know, the the licensing dollars alone from lunchboxes and T-shirts. You know, when coloring books featuring Marvel characters, you know, it's over a billion dollars annually and they're not working for any of that. That's another company making that stuff. Those are fees that they're just getting for not working. You know, you have a an office taking care of that stuff. So I don't ever see Marvel changing hands. That's part of Disney. Now, I do see someone acquiring Disney, perhaps. And then obviously they would own Marvel as, as a part of that. What, what I would see would be more likely to happen and, and i will not be surprised uh if we see this within the next 36 months would be maybe marvel comics going on on a hiatus maybe they just are, are reprinting old comic books that were successful in the past because that's the only thing people care about anyway and perhaps licensing out the publishing rights to other companies boom is out there they're doing a lot of good stuff idw would have been the main um, main company out there that would want to take those but it feels like they're about to go out of business any day now so it's not a great market to do that right now because they're you know image just isn't set up for that kind of stuff i don't know that there's a big company out there that could just take on all the marvel comics but back in the day they did do you know marvel knights where it was you know punisher and daredevil and a few select characters through it through a competitive publisher and it, it did good for the characters so you know who wouldn't want to get the rights to publish spider-man comics who wouldn't want the avengers rights or something like that so i i could see the licensing aspect happen as far as D dc comics i mean they've been part of warner brothers i think since the late 70s early 80s it, it's been it's been decades at this point so there was an opportunity actually for DC Comics to be sold off separately from uh, Warner Media when when uh, AT and T acquired them, they, the way they set it up for the deal, they were actually going to be able to piece things off if AT and T like didn't want a DC Comics. But that was probably the best opportunity for DC to be displaced from Warner Brothers. But obviously, they went along with that deal, and you know, it sounds like um, Warner Brothers is going to be sold off from Discovery soon. Anyway, it's it's weird; they're just tossing them around now. I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, you're you're absolutely correct. It's the IP. They own the IP, and that's where they get their money from, even though they're not doing any work. I, I think I did a video about that probably about two years ago now, and, and that's what's going on. 
So I will cut off there. And I'll have to say that uh, I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Uh, I'd love to have you back, Wes, anytime. Anytime you want to have me, I'll definitely show up. I really appreciate everything that you do for the geek community, RJ, and uh, definitely have you back on the channel uh, to talk about this stuff as well. So everybody should go over and subscribe to um, Thinking Critical on uh, YouTube. I'll put the link in the description. Where else can uh, people find you, Wes? Obviously, I'm, I'm on Twitter at uh, Wes from, from uh, TC, Thinking Critical YouTube. Those are most of the places that you're going to be able to find me. Although I try to stay off the social media for the most part now. It's not healthy. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a good plan. I, I think I uh, should probably do that for myself just for YouTube and uh, cut down a little bit. All right. Well, thank you very much for showing up and, and thank you very much for this conversation. So I want to thank everybody who has made it this far and is still listening. If you have anything to add to this conversation, please put it in the comments. And also just a quick reminder that the links for my graphic novels are in the description. So if any of that sounds or looks appealing to you at all, you might want to check out those links in the description and go on over and see if my graphic novels are for you. All right, I'll leave it there. I'll see you later. Bye.